So hello at Lightbox Expo 2020, and thanks for joining us in these extraordinary circumstances um, to discuss Supercell's brand of, of cinematics and, and what goes into making them. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm a marketing artist at Supercell. And joining me today are my colleagues, Chris Bancroft, also a marketing artist uh, based with me in San Francisco, and Michael German, a brand marketer, writer, and creative partner in crime for most of the spots we'll be discussing today. And also joining us are the ones, uh, the important ones, the ones under the spotlight today. Directors Borja Pena, Trevor Conrad, Jack Anderson, all of SIOP LA, uh, and Sammy Moore and Ewan Stenhouse from Golden Wolf Animation in New York and London. And uh, hopefully I didn't butcher anyone's name. Um, so little background. Every time we release a cinematic animation um, on usually YouTube, we get a lot of love and we get uh, more than a few trolls and we also get a lot of requests to, to buff or nerf one of our characters. Um, and But there's always a comment that runs something along these lines, which is make a movie already. And to those who ask for that, thank you. That's, that's very flattering. And you may be pleasantly surprised by what's coming, but I'm not going to give any more spoilers on that subject. But for now, the truth is this. Supercell makes games. Um, the people who've been giving you a taste of what Clash of Clans or Brawl Stars movie might taste like or feel like uh, work for our amazing partner studios from all over. So when you ask for a movie, what you're really asking for is more of the kind of work that these guys are largely responsible for. Um, so Chris Michael and me and other Supercell artists and creatives uh, work with, with, with these, uh, these men and women to, to bring these animations to life. But the real production happens with them under their direction and at their studios. And so that's, uh, that's, that's where we want to start today. So uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome. Um, just by way of a little bit more intro, um, I wanted to talk first about setting. Um, because we've built all of these worlds essentially from nothing, um, or next to nothing, which is just a, a little screens on a mobile device. Um, so starting in, in, in 2016, um, we started working on, on movies and, and whatnot for Clash Royale, um, which again was a, a mobile game. Uh, hopefully many of you are familiar with it. And um, when we started with this, we had, um, we had some reference from an earlier game, Clash of Clans, which we'd done great cinematics for, Legend of the Lost Lava Pup, even a Super Bowl ad um, back in the day with Liam Neeson. Um, but we made these new worlds essentially from scratch. Um, and so um, I wanted to talk about that. So, so uh, starting with you, Borja, um, you were involved in, in some of the earliest uh, Clash Royale movies, and you were basically creating those worlds from nothing. Can you, can you tell us a little more about the inspiration for that process? Of course. I think the main thing was to make sure that when you see the arenas like for example the royal arena was the first one we worked with on the original films the rules of the duel films um, that which had the anthem film in it as well and for that i think the most important thing was to make sure that when you see the cinematic version and then when you have played the game for so long that there's an instant connection between the two so that they're not they're not completely different but they're clearly inspired by in the sense that we expand on the scale so that we can make it much larger and much more detailed. And one thing that's interesting is that when you play the game, the characters are, are much bigger and, and they have to be so that you can see them on, on smaller screens and on bigger screens. But once you put those characters in the, in the film world, and if you were to design the arena to that scale and make the characters kind of how you would see them in the game, the same way in the cinematic version, suddenly you come up with a problem, which is that the characters don't have a lot of room to traverse and, and to run when they're going from one side to the other. And one thing with these films that is very cool is that they're, they're centered around epic battles. It, it, every film some kind of awesome epic battle, and then we focus on a character and, and their sort of uh, experience during that battle, uh, depending on what we're trying to feature. But when you, when you put a camera down there and when you get these characters running, in there in order to for the, the battle to feel as energetic as like gladiator or something like that you really need scale you need you need distance you want to follow the characters with the camera you want to run with them and you want to run with them long enough that it feels epic and it feels like a really nice high energy moment but then you also don't want to run with them so long that it takes a very long time to get from one tower to the other so the first 
big, big challenge designing these arenas from game to, to the cinematics was the issue of scale. And, and, and I think a big thing that really inspired the scale was definitely that from any kind of perspective that we see from high up, you can really, really relate it to the game. But when you're down there, that we're able to give ourselves a nice playing field to capture like an insane amount of cinematic uh, cameras and action. And when we did the, the first uh, Anthem film, that one in particular was sort of our, our guide because that film required a ton of action. Um, that film also had the camera going from one character doing some crazy action and then to another character and then back to another character. So it was a camera that was free flowing through the entire arena at very high speed. And when we were doing um, the scales closer to the game, we realized that there was not enough room to actually make that exciting. So that's when we started scaling it up, we found the sweet spot where the arenas and, and all the details feel chunky enough that you can recognize them. But scale wise, we have enough room for the characters to be able to run back and forth and feel like an exciting distance where, where it is a little bit of a challenge to get from one side to the other. And if you're faced with opponents along the way, that there is some good conflict there. Um, yeah, also, you know, not only that, I was thinking of some of the spots involved, like uh, shots of the audience, right? And, and the audience being even visible from shots of the, the stadium. So it's not so huge that the audience can't play a role. And I mean, like the Clash uh, character audience, not the literal audience. Oh, for sure. And I think there's like, when you look at the arenas in the game, there's some really key elements that in the design there's always um, the bleachers, there's always the audience portion that has mm -hmm. these awnings of color that kind of help you separate the red from the blue. There's always some kind of middle uh, river or empty space for the bridges to be there. So that's like our sort of climactic point of return. You know, whoever makes it to the other side and we're, we have a little bit of more uh, leverage on who's winning. And then there's the towers. The towers are always so central to the game and, and to your, your sort of progress in the game. And with the bleachers, it's kind of, it's, if you look at the arenas in the, in the films and if you look at the arenas in the game, it's almost like from the center outward, we just exploded them in scale. Like the bleachers in the game, it looks like there's only two or, or, or four on each side. We ended up having, I think like 20 or something like that. And it's a double, double scale um, bleacher. Because again, when you're putting a camera down there and you're focusing on a, on a player, like a character down there, and, and then your camera's looking around, you wanna feel the excitement of all of these um, other characters watching, that, that sort of audience that you would get from an arena or from, from a stadium, but at the same time, keeping it small enough that the characters don't, don't become too small. So that's, um, I feel like that's the coolest thing we end up doing, is just exploding outward in detail and, and scale, but keeping it it's small enough that you can still connect it with the game. Um, but yeah, they, they, that was so the best part of it. So, but it was a process, right? I mean, you, you didn't start out just with like, you know, throwing buildings together in Maya, right? You, you, uh, there was a lot of work that went into to designing these things before they ever became like a, a, a real CGI scene. Um, talk about that, because I mean, you were taking uh, liberties with someone else's babies, someone else's kind of <laughs> world. <laughs> And, and, and uh, you know, building them, um, building, I should say, building an interpretation of them uh, from scratch. So, uh, like, you know, how did you, how did you go through that? How did you, you know, get it past all of, uh, you know, we, we precious folks at Supercell who wanted it to be just so? I, I think it's a collaborative expansion that we did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we just um, made it a little bit bigger, but... Yeah, I think like once you're, the funny thing is that with the game, you're kind of on a top view and a lot of things you don't really necessarily need to focus on. But once you're getting in there and you almost have the camera in the bleachers or you have the camera right into a corner or you're looking at the arena from a different perspective, like from down low, you realize that there's a lot of details missing from that top view that we usually uh, are so used to. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of um, like fun elements that you want to put in there, like Easter eggs. And that's something that was, was pretty interesting um, in sort of the design is, is how do we, what do we add once we're down there? Like, for example, the, the bleachers needed to be tripled, you know, triple the amount of bleachers. And then when you're going into, we do have films where you're looking inside the bleachers. What are the bleachers like? Uh, what, how do the characters get to the bleachers and all that? One thing that's really cool about all the arenas, particularly the Royal Arena, since it's a bit of a labyrinth, is that you could follow a character all the way around all the bleachers. There's, there's a pathway that you don't really ever see in the cinematics, but it's there that you can actually go all the way around the bleachers, come down, sit down, go back out. 
and that felt important for it to feel real and, and, and for it to feel like these characters weren't just placed there. They actually got there. And there, there are details you don't see in the game and there are details that you don't necessarily see in the cinematic. But when you're pausing it and you notice that there's a staircase that, that takes you there, you don't question it anymore. You're not, you're not focused on that. It just feels right. You're just more focused on, on the world and it feels believable enough that you want to get in there a bit more. Yeah. And there's a bunch of stuff like that. I mean, the, the, the one big element that was so central to, to Royal Arena and then became central in all the arenas was the waterfall. Because we're not, we're not used to seeing the waterfall from below. We're used to seeing it from above on coming out of the cauldron. But the waterfall is such an epic, central uh, part of the arena that there was a lot of discussion and a lot of design that we went through back and forth on how big do we make it? What is the scale of it? And what is it constructed of? And in the end, I think we ended up with a very, very cool representation of it. it it's exactly like what you see in the game. Mm -hmm. But the scale from below is just so grand that it gives the arena that opulence that, that, is, that deserves to be called Royal Arena. Mm -hmm. It has that wealth to it and that um, scale that the Royals would have built it with. Yeah. Yeah. You, you guys have also built out uh, the Hog Mountain Arena, um, which was, was uh, revealed for the first time, I think, when Clash Royale was one year old. And later you built the Legendary Arena. And, and I know, Trevor, you've used the Legendary Arena as well. Uh, in fact, Trevor uh, decked out the Legendary Arena for the first time in Halloween and then flooded it with Haunted Elixir. Um, <laughs> so like all of you have, have not only uh, taken, uh, taken our world and interpreted it, you've also taken our world and embellished it, you know, in, in really imaginative ways. Um, does that, what, you know, what was that like for you, Trevor? I, I think it was, you know, taking these worlds that, you know, have been exploded and kind of blown out of proportion uh, is super fun. I think trying to figure out new ways to to show how the game is developing as well is really exciting because, you know, the new skins for each season um, has kind of been a new addition for us and trying again to like be true to the game art that we see that comes in and replicating that in an honest way um, so that, you know, these cinematics do that justice. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of like technical figuring out the proper scale of, you know, the ooze and where it falls from um, and how much it's actually climbing up and around, uh, you know, the various towers. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a back and forth because, you know, you guys pay a lot of attention to the game design and how those new towers are gonna look, whether they're pumpkin skins, <laughs> making sure they look right from, you know, the proper camera angle and that, it's true to the art, uh, you know, that the pumpkins aren't too tall, that they're just round and right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are a yeah. lot of little details that go into that. that you know, it's really annoying, isn't it? I think yeah. one, of the things, <laughs> one of the things I learned with working with Borja and building out the builder base for the master builder spot last year was like, mm. I feel like we're trying to replicate the feeling of what it's like there, but not necessarily exactly yet. I just remember we were analyzing so much in the game and seeing how it's, you know, a perfectly flat location, but quickly realize that wouldn't feel right, you know, yes. in a cinematic, just have a flat island. It's perfectly and boring. Borja, I don't know. I think we probably went through like dozens, dozens and dozens of island sketches trying to figure out that perfect elevation where if you were top down in our uh, cinematic location, it could feel flat, but still, you know, when you had perspective, which you don't get in the game, it still had a feeling of like a real island. Yeah. And I wanted to open up the discussion because we've also created a new world uh, recently called Brawl Stars, which we built from nothing. Um, so there was no clash of clans to, to, to give us any cues about what Brawl Stars was going to look like, just the game itself. So um, uh, Sammy and Ewan, uh, you guys have, have worked on Brawl Stars um, re recently. Uh, tell me what like building a world from nothing was like for, for that setting. Um, I would say, um, I mean, there were some similarities, I think, to, to what the guys just discussed in, in terms of, you know, creating something that felt fitting for a, for a cinematic, you know, something that was a lot more grand and high production, but still had ties into what you see in the game, uh, you know, creating those tethers between, you know, game maps, um, but then just, you know, inflating them and making them you know, a little bit more grand. But I think where, where, the, where the experience probably differed the most for us was that, because Brawl Stars was so new and, and, and really in its infancy in comparison to something like, you know, Clash, um, you guys very quickly sort of 
gave us a lot of freedom to help you, I feel, sort of explore what these places could be and what's over the horizon. And like, you know, maybe we just have the, you know, the fascia of a, of a, of a building here, but, you know, what's it look like inside? And I think that was incredibly fun for us. And it was a super collaborative process. Um, and I know that, you know, there was a point about, you know, you guys, maybe are you protective over the IP and stuff like that? But I feel like we kind of helped create some of that. And now we're sort of a little bit protective over it with you, which is kind of an interesting dynamic, but um, similar kind of things we faced, you know, again, Brawl Stars is, um, you know, very sort of vertical, fairly contained, you know, maps um, built up similarly in a kind of grid, you know. Um, and so it's like, how do we, how do we translate that into um, something that doesn't feel too sort of modular? Um, and I think for the most part, we just, we just dived in and just, and just really had some fun with it. And, and then just thought about the story and how, what's the story we're trying to tell okay, like how do we best create an environment around it and really just letting the stuff that it, um, that's in the game sort of inform inform that. But again, because it was so so young, it didn't feel like we were too tied into anything and that the game could kind of move along with us. Um, I don't know, you and you, what, what do you think? Is that, do I speak for you there? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the one uh, interesting departure point between uh brawl stars and the games that came before is even though as far as the the mobile games concerned it, it is contained within a an arena of sorts but when you actually expand it into the world um it doesn't equate to a stadium as such you know you, you could play in a scenario like the the piper spot for example where in the game her world environment is almost like a uh, a piazza or a courtyard you know enclosed by buildings but that doesn't mean that we have to we had to replicate that in the game um you guys had thought about what was beyond that as well um so we almost had a a, a, a never-ending um world to explore even though as as far as pipe the first half of piper goes we're just in a building um, but by the time we got outside, um, there were a lot of collaborative questions back and forth about what do you see outside of this this game square, and you know what does this this uh, part of the Brawl Stars world look like in general? Um, so we were just kind of figuring this figuring this stuff out as we go along. But there's there's clearly so much more thought that that you guys and the the, the designers and developers have put into it the world outside of what you see in the game. That, that's an interesting segue because, uh, you know, we have, um, we have Lightbox talks going on with, with Brees and Felix to talk about character design and character animation uh, for, for Clash and Brawl respectively. But um, you guys uh, do kind of inherit the characters, which are sort of the soul of mm -hmm. the story. So we, we give you the characters, we give you their design. And, and I mean, they're iconic, uh, but they're, they're also not all that complicated. Right, they tend to form follows function with supercell characters. So, like if you have a miner, he's got a, a mining helmet with a candle and a shovel, and he's short and stumpy so he can fit in the tunnels he digs, and that's it. You know, no backstory, you know, no extended family, uh, not much to go on. Um, and so, we, we create like these new characters by design and hand them off to you to animate and kind of bring bring to life in, in these in these animated worlds. Um, I wanted to talk about that next um, because uh, that's a that's a pretty interesting process. Um, actually, I wanted to start with uh, with uh, my colleague Michael German um, to talk about just uh, how characters are kind of conceived of in the script phase and, and how they uh, you know how we know we're getting it right and then how we hand it off to the directors once we uh, once we've uh, got something down on paper. Yeah, I mean, I think as you called out, um, usually there's not too much thought, or at least that we're privy to about what, you know, what, who the character is. Like, usually we get a sketch. Um, sometimes we know their ability. Sometimes we, we get a little bit of a backstory, just like a little piece of a nugget of something like uh, the mini P.E.K.K.A. being uh, obsessed with pancakes. Um, so things like that that we can build on. But really, it's, it's just looking at the sketch and thinking about the character and finding kind of the flaws and the things that make them interesting uh, to a viewer and as a, as a character. 
Um, and then from there, we kind of uh, start to explore kind of the different stories we can tell about that character, how they relate to other characters. Do they have enemies in the world? Do they have friends in the world? Um, but definitely that's a, a process that, that we go through to, to get to the script. And I think collaborating with the PSYOP directors, kind of taking that to the next level and actually bringing it to life. Yeah. And this is kind of opened up to anyone because we're not just going to confine this discussion to Clash or Brawl characters. Um, but is is there a thing that makes a Supercell character a Supercell character? I mean, maybe the two IP have nothing in common, but maybe they do. So just thoughts on that, because I know you guys have all uh, spent a lot of time with our characters. I can jump in quickly. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely think there's a certain design language, as you were talking about earlier, Eric, with Supercell IP in general, that is iconically Supercell, whether you see it in Clash or um, Brawl Stars, or even some of the work that I did for Rush Wars, mm -hmm. rest in peace. <laughs> uh, um, I know. That, uh, that as soon as you see it, like feels, you know, like it's coming from um, Supercell. And yeah. I think that there's a, there's a, like a tone and a humor that comes with um, each one of your characters, there's a lot of personality and just the design. And I think we also look at, you know, the voices too. There's a lot of attention that goes into, you know, choices for voice actors, um, for voiceover, uh, to make sure that it fits the personality of the characters. And the personalities are so big and bold for, you know, a lot of these characters, whether they're huge, big personalities like Hog Rider mm -hmm. or kind of in the shadows, like um, the builder, for example, you know, who no one really thought of. Um, and I, I think that that seems to be like a common through line for, uh, for a lot of the Supercell characters that at least I've worked with. Think of it like a Supercell character that you've, you've taken from zero, essentially. You, you basically had their character design and maybe a few sketches and not much else. Like, how did you know you were getting it right? Um, when you had so so little to work with from the beginning? I, I think taking a character and kind of doing a fun twist on things, it's, it's a weird blend between like battle oriented meets kind of like 80s, if we're talking about like Rush Wars, for example, um, where there's no story, the game is barely even out or we're not even sure, you know, what's coming with the game and we're trying to like breathe life into these these sketches that we get and um, characters that are still kind of being worked out, like what their techniques are, what their, their moves can be. Um, I feel like making sure that they're kind of unexpected um, and fun uh, really speaks to kind of the tone. And, and I think once, once you get a good chuckle out of a first reaction, you know that you've kind of hit it right. Um, and I, you know, we did some really fun impromptu voiceover uh, exploration for that and, and kind of just went rogue and I, I think finding kind of the right voiceover talent too helps with that and, and letting them kind of bring like a just a natural sort of impromptu um, humor to it and, and I think that that humor is really kind of uh, iconic to Supercell as well. I really I really like that characters are like there's they're, they're always in the gray area in terms of like the pros and the cons like barbarian's a great example of like the easiest thing to do would just be like oh he's just stupid and really dumb but i love that you guys you know set these rules of yeah he's maybe not the sharpest one but he has so much enthusiasm you know and, and those two differences like instantly make some really interesting stuff or the wizard he's very confident but he doesn't always pull it off so i think using that word but when creating characters of you know taking an archetype, but making sure you put just a little twist on it. That's where stuff gets really fun. And I love that there are those rules because very quickly when we're coming up with even little details for background characters, if you know what their personality is, it's very easy to come up with what they would do in that situation. And right, there's a little, little from... caveat here. When, when Jack says rules, we have to put big air quotes around <laughs> rules. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it's also nice... Um... There's usually like, depending on the, on the film, there's always a, a, a cinematic theme behind it uh, that kind of drives how we approach the characters. But what's cool about the Clash world too, that, that lets it be so unique and, and universal at the same time is that there's never, there's never an extreme of an emotion. There's never pain, there's never full sadness. Uh, there's never full anger. There's suggestions to it, but it, it lives in this very playful space 
that allows the characters to always be approachable, even when they're getting blown up or something, you know, after an explosion, they're right back to like, hey, that was fun. And that, I feel like that allows the, the whole world to be very playful and never lean on too much of an emotional state where you, where you might go too extreme. And, and yeah, that, that's a very unique thing uh, to the Supercell films where they're always incredibly fun to watch. And, and it allows us as directors to really push the boundary of, of what sort of cinematic element we need to add, like whether we need to blow up a character or whether we need to uh, make a character feel left out. It's never so extreme that, that um, it, it hurts the character. It's still like a very playful environment for all Except of them. Except if, if they're goblins, then, then you <laughs> hurt them all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's another rule of Super Saiyan. <laughs> or skeletons. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. skeletons They're too. expendable. <laughs> yeah, right, totally. Um, actually, I wanted to, to, to include Brawl in this discussion because, again, like, that, that's an even bigger challenge. Uh, Supercell characters in Clash tend to be, or Rush Wars, tend to be a little bit more, you know, Shades of DreamWorks characters, those kind of things. But Brawl characters are, are different. They're chibi in, in their design and stuff like that. So giving them life and personality, that, that must be an interesting process. Can you, can you guys talk about that a, a little bit? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I would, I, I completely agree with, with with what Trevor said about the sort of uh, the, the similarities between the, the the worlds. And there is a there's a there's a simplicity, and I think a, a word that always sticks out to me is like a confidence as well in in the designs. Um, they're not over designed, you know. And whether that is a function thing or a you know a style thing is is you know maybe besides the point. Like they, it just sort of gets to a point where um, it's easy, and it's hard to. It's hard to put my finger on why, but it, it just feels easy to dream of backstories about these characters. Um, and whether some of them do look sort of uh, obvious, like for instance, I think I think a good one for Brawl Stars is uh, is Frank, who's obviously sort of uh, a Frankenstein inspired character, carries a big tombstone sledgehammer, and you know his attack is like super aggressive, like this big just melee smash, and like you you could very easily just assume like oh this guy's just like a dumb you know, Lenny from Mice and Men kind of like monster. <laughs> yeah. um, but what's fun, and this has been pretty much consistent on working on Brawl with you guys, is that it feels pretty open. Unless unless there's some dreamed up backstories that you guys have had in-house, you know, it's very much like, tell us who you think this person could be and then go have fun with it. And, and you know, when we did the uh, the Brawloween with, with Mortis and, and Frank, you know, what we ended up doing was, you know, I... Chris, you might be able to correct me on this. I don't remember whose idea it was. It wasn't mine. But, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, we paint Frank to actually be this very tolerant, gentle guy who's actually, Mortis is the really, like, awful person. And he's, you know, it's like his roommate and he's constantly just trying to simmer down his temper. And, and you know, all of these moments give us, you know, once we once we came up with these sort of personality traits about him, that's, I mean that's joyous to be able to hand over to an animation team then, you know, you know, not just saying like, Oh, in this scene, he gets angry and then he hits Morris with a hammer. It's like in this scene, you know, he's finally come to the end of like two weeks worth of like nonsense. He's, he's come to the end of his tether. Previously, this happened in his past. This happened. He's worried about this. He's scared of that and all this. And like, maybe some of it is just over the top, but it's more fun that way anyway, for us to just discuss, you give that to an animator and you just get much more like nuanced character acting and, this just adds this richness to it, which I don't think you would get if the characters were super prescriptive or just kind of followed generic kind of traits. And so, again, where maybe Brawl Stars sort of separates itself from Clash in that respect is that, you know, there's still so many decisions to be made. Um, and we're always super pleased to be along to make them with you, you know. Um, yeah, well, let's talk. Uh, let's talk more about Brawl Stars. Uh, this is actually more Chris's domain than mine, um, so I, I definitely want to um, kind of hand the hand the baton to him. Um, but yeah, let, let's talk about uh, how Brawl Stars was brought to life. Um, I think we started with no time to explain uh, during the during the launch. Yeah, and Golden Wolf's been involved since before the games launched, since That's the true. beta, beta true. days. And some of the early development work is is still influencing us now. Um, so yeah, I guess we, we should just kind of dive into the brawl world for a bit. Um, at least in, I was, uh, this was before I joined Supercell, but no time to explain was the, the launch cinematic, the global launch cinematic for the brawl world. Um, when I first saw that, I was just blown away. It was like, it's nothing else that I had seen before. It was just really playful and fun, big, bright colors, big, fast action 
fun character designs. Um, then after that, we continued developing hybrid and 2D animations, uh, many of them with Golden Wolf. Since you guys have been involved since way, way before, um, can you talk about how the Brawl world has changed, how the style has developed, and what, if anything, has stayed the same since way before beta? Yeah. Um, you and, do, you want, do you want to let me handle that one, or do you want to tackle it? I, mean, I was just going to say off, off, the, off the start, um, and I, I, I think you'd probably say the same thing, Sammy, but I know initially, at least with no time to explain, same as you, Chris, I, I didn't work on that one. Sammy is um, the only one of the three of us who, who's been on it since the beginning. But that kind of hybrid style was really, uh, um, came about by the, the combination of Psyop and Golden Wolf. Like, you take two companies who specialize in two different things, 3D for PSYOP and, and 2D for Golden Wolf and like put the best of them together and, and this is what you get. You get this incredibly rich 3D world that has this ridiculous 2D animation built into it. And that was, that was just the starting point. I know, I know there have been a whole bunch of experiments in between the latest two, um, but I, th I feel like that was also a good reason to revisit that that initial style because it is such a powerful combination um, between us two. Um, but yeah, Sammy, I mean, you've you've been a lot closer to to that from the beginning, so you could probably fill out that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean that's all spot on. Um, I think the the first piece, no time to explain, was was really. I mean, that was so much fun for us because we don't we just don't get to work in in three D very often, uh, and the Sayab team. Are just like incredible at what they do and and again i think you know you take all the expertise and brains on the 3d side and mix them with the equivalent on our side like we were just able to let everybody do what they do best and nobody was sort of uh you know doing any guesswork or whatever it was just a, a a bunch of really talented people which is obviously always always a joy but um again i think with it being such a, a young ip brawl stars it was just fun to kind of you know obviously we started with a full 3d 2d mix then we went to do some 2.5D and then uh, the full, full cell stuff. And, you know, I know that there's been, you know, a lot of different outcomes. And I think what's been fun is figuring out what works what, and, and more importantly, what doesn't work. Uh, but then just seeing which, which are the things that sing in each spot. And I think that helps us kind of figure out what, what Brawl Stars is uh, even more clearly with each piece of content that comes out. And, you know, I think, so what's changed is, yeah, stylistically, a lot of, most of the spots look very different, different. But to me, one thing that stays very much the same is just this this focus on on humor and just like mayhem. Um, you know, there's 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 constantly a spotlight being shown shown on, onto these really wonderful characters that you kind of want to know more about. And whether that means you just look forward to the next uh, spot that comes out, or if it makes you want to play the game, um, it's all just very irreverent, like fun, lighthearted, playful violence. Um, and it's all just wrapped in this, you know, uh, beautiful package. And, and th there's things that do stay the same that help us, things like shape language and stuff like that, you know, like maintaining this, this chunky, overstated, sort of exaggerated style to the buildings and the weapons and stuff like that help kind of ground everything in the same universe, even if they do look, you know, if they, they do have a different look and feel. Um, but to us, it feels like it's still, like we're still kind of figuring things out um which is such a, a fun place to be you know yeah the brawl is kind of an interesting game it's it's newer and we're very community focused we we intentionally were very cautious about adding too much backstory or detail to the worlds and the characters too early we we're cautious because we want the players in the community to kind of like live with the characters and to own them themselves so one thing that we do is we try to like keep them from being too specific too early on. And then another weird thing that we do is we try to appeal to both the players, the community that already plays the game and just broader general audiences that don't play the game. Um, that's a weird balance, I'd say, like throwing, throwing characters in a story at you and say, go make something really cool, but don't do too much. We don't want to reveal this yet. How do you balance things that are like somewhere between too generic and too specific? 
on aren't there as well um I, I'm, I'm not sure correct me if i'm wrong but um the community also kind of infer so much themselves from from what they're seeing as well like the, the the one that i like the most is that they believe in this love story between uh rico and bb um was that something that you guys seeded or did did they come up with that all of, all on their own rico and oh piper. rico and piper yeah um, that, i think that was like a reddit post somebody <laughs> was was shipping them together and <laughs> it, we just kind of I don't know. We just allowed it. I think, uh, Sammy, I think that was, um, you started adding that as Easter eggs in the background. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, a, I know you guys sort of raised that as, as an intention for these two later spots early and, and it was a challenge, but I think, um, it was, it was, it was very doable by just sort of making sure that I think, you know, obviously we want to appeal to people who play the game and kind of get excited by that this is their game and, and, and then to people who have never even heard of Raw Stars. And the, the key thing was like, okay, let's focus on storytelling. You know, like we want to tell the most successful, entertaining story possible. Um, you know, that speaks to everybody. And then, you know, if we can create some interest around these characters, that speaks to new people. Um, but then, you know, we can, we can create this extra sort of satisfaction and, uh, you know, sort of give back to the community by things like Easter eggs are an easy one, but also just little things that do nod to, you know, theories and stuff like that, because I mean, you and you're right, they, they really don't miss a beat. Um, and so, you know, once we, you know, there's a, there's a moment in Piper where, I mean, she's just very indiscriminately throwing grenades, like at everybody, everybody who's in sight is a target. Rico happens to be one of them. And yeah, there's this theory going around that they, they have some sort of romantic connection. So, you know, we were able to, instead of have her throw it, she sort of like blows a kiss and it, it flies out of her hand and people go nuts for that. They're like, I knew it, you know, and, and seeing that is really funny, you know, because the, the people who don't even know who Rico and, uh, and Piper are still see that as a beautiful piece of character acting. It's a fun moment, but it has an whole alternate meaning for people who you know play the game and are invested. And so mm -hmm. to be able to entertain on those two levels is something that like, it's very uncommon for us as a studio. Um, but it's, yeah, it's incredibly rewarding, but, um, it's, it's very much just kind of trial and error and sort of figuring it out as we go, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, for us, it's a, it's a weird thing I'd say. Um, we're trying to make something that's, that's entertaining in the moment, but we also want people to rewatch it for, for like years and years to come. We, same as how we approach the games. It's like we want everybody to play it. We want it for, for as many people as possible, but we want them to keep playing for years and years. Um, that feels, I would just jump in real quick. That feels very quintessentially Supercell too, like a real staple of, you know, putting in all those little nuggets and hidden gems from comments in the YouTube videos um, to, you know, moments from previous games that are speckled into it, whether it's in Brawl Stars or Clash of Clans or Clash Royale. Like that's, uh, I feel like it's a really nice sort of nod back to the community and, and um, something that I love picking a part into just as a, you know, a Royale player myself. Uh, well, having we, the, we gave uh, Barley a wizard skin right out the bat, but you know, that was a marketing yeah. stunt, so. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, yeah, I, like, even like with builder leaves, you know, doing a little like replica of the last lava pup, you know, um, small little winks and nods back to other parts of, you know, the campaign is, uh, yeah, feels very true to your guys' brand. Yeah. So um, one of the things that actually I think Brawl uh, really kind of inspired um, was like this, this amazing um, combination of 2D and 3D. It's something we hadn't done before. Um, and it's it's not only something that we did in Brawl starting in No Time to Explain, but it's also something that we we loved so much that we borrowed for for Rush Wars. Um, so we, can we we can talk about that that kind of two track two studio approach? Because we, we said you married Golden Wolf and Psyop together as as um, specialists in both to really make this this cool new world. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, there's <clears throat> there's there's nothing we Golden Wolf as a studio love more than just crazy bombastic effects. Like that's our, uh, that's really our, our wheelhouse. Um, combining, combining the two between the, between the studios, 
I don't want to. I don't want to say it's easier than you'd think because it's definitely not easy. Um, but it's maybe because we've um, you know established so much of it during No Time to Explain. But it's kind of a there's a good synergy between the two studios that makes makes it a relatively easy process to do. Kind of um, you know starting with. Uh, doing a 3D block out and then we just we just take that and, and start roughing in our, our 2D effects and there's a bit of kind of a ping pong nature between the studios until we've got locked picture uh, to animate to. I know that with um, between No Time to Explain and the latest two there was certainly an evolution in um, technical finesse I guess is the best way to put it like no time to explain the, the the 2d effects was was very deliberately 2d like the, there wasn't a huge amount of work done to try and integrate it in, into the world other than kind of basic contact shadows and and the old gradient here and there and with the latest two there was definitely a a desire to take that to the next to the next step like how how do we retain that that 2D feel, but integrate it better into the 3D world, so you do get a proper, a proper um, synergy of these these two very different worlds. Um, Sammy, did you uh, speaking yeah, from I mean, having worked across both? Um, how do you feel the, the the process between the two kind of work differently? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think. What was what was really good about No Time to Explain is uh, you know it was whilst you know there's 2D over live action and 2D over 3D that exists it just felt so fresh and it felt so new um, but we really didn't make an effort to sort of conceal that it was 2D it was very much like look at these 2D effects like mixed in with these 2D characters it was very much a stylistic and a sort of artistic choice and you know looking back on it I still love that piece but you know I think um, we we all kind of decided that you know there's i think there's more to gain from making everything feel like it's all in this world it doesn't need to be 2d 3d like let's blur the let's blur the edges and let's just create like a really colorful exciting world um and so on these latest two spots you know it was uh, there was a lot of time and a lot of effort put into finding ways to ground these effects inside uh, the 3d lighting and beside the characters and stuff and so to the point where if I mean, there's a, there's a moment, for example, in um, in the in the Bali bar spot where M's the sort of zombie girl is like spraying hairspray. Now I wouldn't blame anybody who thinks that that is the CG. You know, um, the the hairspray effect goes through went through so many more compositing phases this time around, and we really push things to feel a lot more illustrative and and, and almost painted, and and it just create. I mean, we're all over the moon with how it turned out. Um, but I think once we realize that like it doesn't matter if it doesn't look 2D anymore, like does it does it work in space? Is it is it fun? Is it exciting? Does it match the character? Does it, you know, flow with the action well and stuff? And once you kind of take those clamps off, um, it freed us up to do a lot more, I think, this time around. Um, and the environments were a lot more um, ambitious this time around from a lighting perspective. And that did make integrating effects a lot more challenging, but um, we, I think we ended up with something that just felt like a lot more packaged up and, and it wasn't quite so, uh, it wasn't quite so sort of superimposed. I don't want to use that word really, but you know, it, it wasn't about, Hey, look, we're using 2D effects. It was just about a cool story that looked beautiful, you know? Um, and I'm kind of worried that if we ever have to do one again, how we elevate it again, because I'm <laughs> glad <it> is. <laughs> Okay, so starting from 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 Brawl Stars, everybody was uh, impressed by a lot of things about Brawl. Um, one of them was some of the rules for Supercell, and I, that's why I use rules and air quotes. We broke uh, regarding squash and stretch. So, so like if you take a look at the frame by frame on Brawl Stars, uh, Colt is is like a piece of taffy. I mean, he is just. <laughs> As, as, as tall as the screen uh, in some of the shots. And um, I remember the first time like we did that in, in Clash, it was almost like a subversive act because that was a rule of Clash that you don't squash and stretch to the same extent, same you know, cartoony extremes. 
Um, but in Rush Wars, and this kind of goes back to Trevor, we, we took a, a kind of a clash style IP, for lack of a better word, and applied like Brawl Stars rules to it. So, so Trevor, do you want to talk a little bit about like what we did there? Sure. Yeah, I think for R Rush Wars was kind of an interesting project because, you know, the game wasn't out yet. Um, and it came, I think, right in between, you know, a lot of the learnings and the stuff we'd done with Clash. Uh, and right after sort of the very first No Time to Explain came out. And I think the, you know, the Rush Wars trailer was like a really nice blend between, you know, some of the very truisms we've learned in Clash mixed with some of the stuff we really liked in Brawl Stars, you know, the 2D effects, the squash and stretch animation, and really pushing, you know, our animators that traditionally, you know, didn't squash and stretch to the extreme of Clash characters like that and, and pushing it further into kind of that Brawl, Brawl Stars world. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the tone and the look of it kind of has a little bit of that kind of blend from Clash meets Boom Beach, 80s sort of A-team feel. And then some of, again, some of the techniques that, you know, we learned that, you um, we really like from Brawl Stars, you know, 2D uh, smoke effects. And I think, you know, we blended those in a little bit more uh, perhaps than kind of the more anime feeling stuff from Brawl Stars. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they continue to push that into, you know, the latest version that they've done. Uh, but it was again, kind of a mixing of those worlds a little bit, um, pushing that squash and stretch, keeping a more sort of jungly vibe to it, keeping the tone very like funny, um, and, and pushing that. Mm -hmm. And, and you and, and Sammy, uh, I wanted to go back to you a second. So you've done, um, you've done 2d spots for us for both clash and brawl, and you've also done two and a half D and it seems like recently we've come back to two and a half D and, and elevated it. Um, you know, what, are, what's the pros and cons? Like, uh, why did you guys come back to the, you know, the kind of the two and a half D style, which where we mix uh, 3D animation and 2D effects. Um, me, me and you were asking ourselves this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, not that we don't love it. I was just thinking why I thought maybe it's just because you guys loved it. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, again, it's, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for us to work on a bit of a grander scale, I think is certainly one of the main reasons for me. I mean, we're a relatively small studio. Um, you know, we're about, 20 in, in the UK and about five in, in New York. So, you know, just in terms of like the scope of the project, it's not something that we could, you know, you know, work on something this grand, like I say, ordinarily, but, you know, we're very close and, and good pals with, with PSYOP and, and it was such a fun opportunity the first time around. So we just jumped on it just from a selfish point of view, because it, it was fun, you know, but I think more than anything, it's just, uh, it's a, it, it's an opportunity to, um, to just tell 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 these stories that I mean, you guys are so focused on um, telling these sort of larger than life stories that um, we feel like we you know working with Psyop and another team of professionals, we could just maybe go a little bit harder. Um, and it's just a bigger production than we're used to, you know. Um, I think there's a there's like sorry to interrupt, Sammy. There's like another mean? technical complication aspect to making it like two and a half D where. You know, when you're doing just like an explosion effect that doesn't interact with the characters, you can kind of get away with animating it on twos or fours. Um, but as soon as you start having it interacting with characters, you know, and following like the real motion or having it come off a sword or out of a megaphone, uh, the animation really needs to start matching t to the frame, you know, animating on ones, which is generally not kind of how an entire film would be done in 2D. Um, and so there's a, another level of technicality that comes to integrating it more into sort of the CG aspect that it's easier for us to do that on the 3D side. It becomes a more tedious task on the 2D. <laughs> I'm curious if you guys agree with this. When I, when I look at the 2D and 3D work done on both Clash and Brawl, the, the 2D stuff, as great as it was, almost didn't have the same level of like drama um, and, and storytelling, I think because of the, the medium and the way that it was executed. Um, it almost started to fall into like a more slapsticky, cartoony Saturday morning cartoon vibe um, versus when we, when we brought in the 3D and to a 2D, I think there's like a, a level of storytelling and drama that, that kind of balance out the, the jokes. I'm curious if you guys agree with that.
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was far. Yeah, uh, go for it, Sam. No, you're good. You got yeah, Sammy. You you got to do it. <laughs> no, I no, I no, I, I I do agree for sure. Um, I I I don't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's it's also um, it's a little bit of the. It's like the limitations and sort of the expectation of 2D. Like you, I feel like with 2D, a lot of times you feel like you have to animate a whole bunch uh, mm. and not let the camera just sit, which is more like cinema, like cinematic stuff. Like usually you can, you can let it sit, you can let it breathe, the shots are wider and all that. And sometimes with the, the 2D stuff, you kind of feel like you have to constantly move and get this and this. But I feel like when um, like Brawl Stars, the, particularly the new stuff um, and even um, Rush Wars, they're, there's enough there where it feels like it's got the same fun and squishiness that you can only do with 2D, but it's got the cinematic quality that you can that you usually see with 3D, the, the angles and slight breath, particularly with the Piper spot. There's just a great ending shot that feels very cinema, almost feels like a the 2D, 3D version of a Saving Private Ryan moment, you know, in, in its own <laughs> way. Yeah. And if there's something cool about like the 3d just really ties it to the game as well. Cause the game has such a CG quality to it, but, but that marriage of the two expands it to where it feels cinematic and it takes it away from like having to do something crazy. There's enough stuff going on, but you have this great slow camera following a character, which is incredibly heroic and cinematic. Yeah. Let uh, that sink in uh, guys. You just got compared favorably to Steven Spielberg. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I think at least like on the, the background of Brawl Stars. Um, early on, the game we just didn't want to put too much into it. It's like a very actiony game, um, so we were treating a lot of the creatives as big explosions, big action, just lots of mayhem and brawling. Uh, then, like through the two D, the two and a half D uh, pieces, we just kept trying to push it a little bit more and more, and we started to feel like the community was ready to have like deeper character stories. So from Retropolis or from No Time to Explain to Retropolis to China Launch to Brawloween, we felt like the world was ready, like the Brawl world was ready for a deeper story, like a more character oriented story where we can actually show a little bit more than just like fighting. But at the same time, we don't want to go too far away from it. Like Brawl Stars is action, it is fighting. Um, at, at least for me, it felt like it was the right time. And we called it no time to explain plus and just threw it in your lap and said, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah. Hopefully this comes together. The balance, the, the balance is, is just gorgeous. It's, it's a unique aesthetic, but it's so cinematic now that you, you, can, you can really imagine a film happening out of that. It's, like it's, a, it's so lush, you know, and, and so unique. Yeah, I, th I think we landed on a real sweet spot in the end. Um, I appreciated sort of like what you said, Chris, not wanting to, you know, pump too much story into it, but I think there was enough interest and enough world surrounding that people would value knowing a little bit more about characters. Yeah. And, and, and also I think it's, uh, and when I say sweet spot, there's the right place for it too, is that you give people just enough to give, yeah, give them more questions. You know, like you don't want to just answer mm. every questions about a character. You want to, you want to have them walk away with even more and create some more interest around, you know, these, these locales and these uh, new characters and stuff. But, you know, one thing that I found really interesting is, you know, I'd show it to people and, and often it, it was not, you know, people in the animation industry, but, you know, I'd show these spots to people and then, and they always say something along the lines of like, it's something about this. I can't put my finger on it. And when you show them those like squash and stretch frames, it like blows people's minds, you know, and like, you know, Colt falling through the air is a really good one where his eyes are just ridiculous, you know, like it's <laughs> like very Roger Rabbit kind of going on. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, that's a reference we talked about a lot, but I think that helps meld the 2d and the 3d together a little bit more you know because it sure. is associated with 2d and, yeah. and it's just it just really helped everything like click into place and 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 some of my favorite still frames are like are those ones you know where there's just like 20 fingers on a hand and things like that you know like really taking 2d tropes and using them in 3d just created something that's uh that's pretty special yeah Hey, so there's there's no graceful way to transition into this last part uh, since it is uh, not about 2D or 3D, or maybe it's just about 3D. Um, but um, Jack, I wanted to to turn to you a little bit because we've been we did an experiment um, which will be live by the time this goes live, 
um, where we have worked in real time, and specifically in the Unreal Engine. And um, what's interesting is we did a cinematic in the normal pipeline, uh, like we've done every other Supercell cinematic in like the Arnold and Maya pipeline. Um, but we've also uh, done a, a follow-up to that, which was done in Unreal, which is dealing with the same setting and the same subject. Um, so um, can, you, can you introduce us to that a little bit, Jack, and, and just tell us about what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we as a studio have constantly been saying, oh, Unreal, Unreal, we should try more stuff in real time. And, you know, I think approach-wise, what we've talked about with Supercell as well is what would make the most sense would be to do it on on a new IP, right? Because we've we put so much time into making everything look great for Clash in particular, you know, in an Arnold world and the idea of moving that to a different look or into a different engine but keep the same look is very hard um so that's what's been really fun and challenging on this project is that these uh this party king thing uh has two components one the cinematic which is you know at the visual bar that we're used to for a supercell spot but then also doing this real-time game show um and yeah, it's been really interesting to, you know, work in two different pipelines. Um, I'm really proud of the team for matching, I think, very indistinguishably close uh, character-wise to, to a render look. Um, I think, in fact, I've been, you know, creatively very impressed just by how quickly it is to iterate, I guess, um, you know, on this uh uh, Party King cinematic, we were, you know, talking 12 hours of frame to render. And, you know, at the very end, it would take, you know, several days just to get it through a render farm for uh, me and the Supercell team to be able to see it and comment on it. Um, and the fact here that it really is real time has been amazing that like, you know, I can see a shot, make a note on it and five minutes later, get an update. Um, you know, I think the struggles moving forward, if we are to use this tech more is, uh, really just effects. I feel like part of the Clash look, so much of it is uh, explosions, uh, volumetric, not to mention all the millions of blades of grass on the ground. And I think that's the biggest thing Unreal struggles with. Um, so, you know, I think in the meantime, we're going to be looking for creative solves around that stuff if we are to use that more. Um, but, yeah, I mean... The thing I'm most excited about with it, though, is, you know, if it unlocks uh, the ability to do longer form stuff, uh, then it's really exciting, right? It's, you know, it takes us months and months and, you know, collectively thousands of hours of work and, you know, a ton of render time to make a 40 second spot. And what's been really fun on this uh, uh, King of Clash trivia show is the idea of pulling off a nine and a half minute piece and I think less than a month is what it's coming down to. So what, what, we really go ahead, Eric. Sorry. No, I was going to say, why didn't we do the whole thing in the Unreal? Right? I mean, <laughs> I was going to say it's got to be really interesting for you, Jack, the, the, to having been directing animators and, and the animation from from storyboard to all that, and then all of a sudden you get to direct an actor. Um, yeah, for, for a little <laughs> yeah. bit, you know, like a real person that then becomes the party king. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I th I have to say, like, I think one of our big reservations because we, I think, you know, Eric and I have brought this up, you know, over the years and, you know, this idea of putting mocap on a Clash character uh, has seemed very weird just because uh, we have a very unique keyframe style for these Clash characters. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, it's it's interesting. I think we found a pretty good process of, it definitely feels different, undeniably, but we do go back and hand key just, you know, certain moments, especially in the face, just to try and keep that cartooniness. Um, and it's different. I mean, it's it's, it's cool. Uh, it, it's different in a cool way to see just a very raw performance and see an actor do things that an animator could never think of, or even just in, you know, the audio performance of not hearing someone talk and saying, what did you say? And all of these very unique things that, you know, you would just never do uh, in, a, in keyframe animation um, really just bring like this cool... Uh, sense of reality to the character that has been super exciting to see. What are you guys going to call that? If if uh, with Brawl Stars and Rush Wars you have 2.5D with 3D, and now you have somebody <laughs> really acting it out, but then you're augmenting their acting with with keyframes in 3D. Real yeah. D, real D. Okay, real D. <laughs> 
you invented a Very new uh, approach. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Patent pending. Um, <laughs> okay. So, you know, um, sadly, we have to wrap things up um, eventually, and I guess that time is now. But I, I did want to give uh, the directors, uh, uh, any of the directors, a chance to uh, to just sort of sound off on. Um, you know, what it's like to have, for them to have worked with Supercell. Um, you know, now's your time to take revenge. Tell us what, tell the world what a pain in the ass we are. I can, I can go first real quick. I, I think it's, it's honestly been a, a, a bit of a dream come true for animation directors and, and for directors to be working with such awesome talent and such hungry for creative awesomeness uh, group of, of artists at Supercell that, you guys have allowed us to just allow or just our dreams and our, and our ideas to come true in such a great collaborative way with wow. such an amazing lush world and, and characters that it's been easy and fun. Um, and every day going to work is just the, the coolest thing in the world. So I really thank you guys. Venmo or PayPal? I mean, how, how do I... <laughs> no, no, that's honest. That's okay. very honest. Very honest. Right, cool. Um, you guys it have sucks. all... No, it <laughs> <laughs> Eric is a pain no, but I think <laughs> yeah, okay. See, no, I think what's really true to what Borja just said is is the fact that uh, you guys know what you're talking about. I mean, a lot of you guys come from X kind of film worlds or animation backgrounds, unlike a lot of our other clients. And um, there is a standard inequality that you guys expect that a lot of our other clients don't. And it's the same that we do too. It's just you know we a lot of times don't have the time or the end like the resources to push for that and, and having you guys help back and push that. I think you see it in the end product uh, with a lot of these spots. So um, we are though a kind of a second layer of input. Uh, and, and I think that can, that can derail things or it can at least cause, you know, what we call scope creep where, you know, someone says at some point, wouldn't it be nice if we did this and, and you have to, you have to contend with that. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Like how, how do you balance like our input versus like your vision, which has to be, I think in the end, your vision for, for these different spots. I think one thing that offsets that for me working with you guys is, um, yeah, it's so great to be working alongside artists, but I like that there isn't creativity by a huge committee working with Supercell. It's fun <laughs> to get on the phone with you guys and be on the phone with you know the final decision makers. Um, and I think in that sense, there actually is a lot less scope creep than a lot of other clients who, you know, a lot of times will be halfway through a project and some CMOs, bosses, bosses, boss will finally chime in, um, you know, and, and uh, something will change. And, you know, that doesn't happen with you guys, uh, which is very unique. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I think of, on, on our side, um, I mean, something that uh, we, at, we at Golden Wolf, particularly me and you and, you know, really put a lot of time into is like creating an environment when we're directing where people feel comfortable, not just the client, obviously, but like the team as well to like say what they think doesn't work or could work better or whatever. And I think, you know, speaking back to why it's nice to work with you guys is you're all focused on storytelling and, you know, obviously all have like creative knowledge and like good expertise and stuff. I used to hate getting drawovers from Eric though, because they were nicer than my actual drawing. <laughs> um, but I think, it might sound like a little bit overly simplistic, but when this over, what do we call it? Scope creep. Um, yeah. You know what? It's just a case of like, you know, how we deal with that is we just have a conversation, you know, and if, if we're able to all sit down together and have a conversation, is this where we should spend our time? Like, are we getting more entertainment spending time here? You know, what about if we spend the time over there and whatever? I, I don't feel that we've ever really had a bad experience in that respect. Um, and I think if everybody feels comfortable having those conversations, if we can make a decision, then, you know, we're, we're doing things the right way. Um, you and what, what do you think, man? Uh, I, I think you guys have all said it <laughs> far better than I can articulate. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I think we, I think we prefer to have people who are like, you know, we, we'd rather have somebody who has too many notes, you know, and, and, and is invested, you know, rather than somebody who just wants to push it over the line and isn't as focused on quality and, I'm saying that now because we've finished Brawl Stars. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is all being recorded, you know yeah, that, right? No, no. But I, I, no, I, do, I do mean that, you know, and you know, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure, and I hope, hope we continue. Okay. So uh, last question, um, just to, to all the directors, uh, and in no particular order, uh, 
what guidance would you give to, to other people who wanted to follow in your, your footsteps, become directors themselves? Don't do it. Become a gardener. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Br brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> I think I, I would say don't, don't stop uh, being interested in everything. Like, I think at the beginning, there's no need to focus uh, just yet. It's, it's okay to be purely interested in, in music and 2D and 3D and storytelling and writing. Like, eventually, as, as if you want to become a, a director, you, you're going to hone in all of those things into one funnel. And then the way that you output your feedback and your uh, style and your ideas, it's going to be because you've been interested in all those things because it does involve the full package, you know? So it's, I think it's good to keep your mind completely loose and, and just become an ADD uh, artist for, for a while before <laughs> nice. you eventually narrow it down. Nice. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. Just get your, get your inspiration from, from everywhere and anywhere you can, you know, and you don't realize until you're, you know, in the thick of it on a job, when you think of some obscure reference or like this cooking show you saw or this song or like something, you know, and it's another nice thing about working with PSYOP is being able to mix with so many people who, you know, like 3D artists and, and people that we don't normally spend time with um, and just seeing how you can draw inspiration and, and reference from, from everything. So I think that's a really nice point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And start, start thinking about what stories you like to tell and what stories you like to, you like to watch or read yourself. Um, that's as good a guide as any. I, yeah, I'd say just make stuff, just keep making things, you know, and share them too. I would post it, share it because you'll grow from, you know, even finishing things that you look back on that you don't like. I, I think if you have an opportunity at work to make it great, you know, if, if not do it on the side, but just keep, keep crafting, keep making things because you learn from I think, experiences. I think for me, the thing that, you know, when I've seen artists rise up to the rank to director or to, you know, senior leadership or, the people that bring ideas to every project, you know, I, I call them button pushers, artists that, you know, they just do exactly what you told them to do and nothing more. And I think, you know, if you can have the personality, no matter what you're doing in any capacity on, you know, a design project of bringing your own flourish or suggesting a, a new idea, um, I think, you know, that that's the trait that uh, allows people to rise up. I think one, one last tiny thing is, it is true that it, it, it says, it's been said a lot it, that it takes a village. I think you have to imagine too, behind every film that Psyop and Golden Wolf has ever made for Supercell, there's so many people, like so many insanely talented yeah. people that, that come into it and every single artist, whether it's the guy doing just the chair in the background or whatever, or, or the girl who did a cloud or something like that. Every single person has contributed an idea that's kind of allowed it to grow. So it's important to love collaboration. It's everything's about collaboration. And, and you as an individual can't make anything. You need everybody together. Um, so it's, yeah, I think that's a huge thing that's really awesome about uh, PSYOP, Golden Wolf and Supercell. There's, there's just insane teams behind it all uh, just to create one perfect square image, uh, which I think is really fascinating. Make things with people you like. I wanted to thank all of you guys for, for joining us today. Um, and uh, just for kind of peeling back the curtain on, on how we've done all this and, and how we'll continue to do all this. Um, it's been great working with you and thank you for, uh, thank you for, for coming along for the journey. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thank you so much.